piece there, the Coque la la that, yeah. that incredible type of, um, here it is, that's, yeah. the, 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 this is the treatise where all these brilliant young things decided that they were going to take over the world and tell people what they should listen to and shouldn't listen to, down with this, down with that. Yes. And actually, you need a cocktail to, to, to get, as a ringmaster, Jagleff is another one. Mm. Cocktails, Jagleff, these are the ring, they don't do very much really. Cocktail's an okay poet and pretty good filmmaker. And a, you know, he's a minor figure, I think, and although one has a kid, I used to think he was just sublime, but I think he's, I think he's minor compared to Poulenc, I really do. Jagleff, these are not people who do things, but they make, they're animateur, they make things happen, and they are, they are what young people now call them, what they call them on YouTube? Um, influencers. They are influencers. Yes, well, I think <laughs> Auden once said you wouldn't need a bookshelf to have the complete works of Cocteau, you'd need a warehouse. <laughs> and I mean, to and a certain extent, without um, Cocteau, the 1920s, 30s in France would be unimaginable because even if you can't pin down a work, well, actually, I think some of the films are pretty amazing. Yes, of course. But in fact, um, when you, you're right about the poetry. And, uh, but well, the two things about, about Cocteau, they're great at everybody's. There are greater filmmakers, there are greater poets, there are greater everything, but no greater um, inventor, yeah. really, of people and illustrator of people. And animateur. Animateur, exactly right. Mm. And that's how Poulenc begins. And it's interesting because I don't know who's inventing whom, whether Cocteau is discovering Poulenc and Ulrich and that lot, or whether they're using Cocteau because he's the man about town. Mm. Um, it's such a 20s thing that I think of um, Walton, and, Walton and the Sitwells, the same yes. thing, you know. Suddenly these people are being talked up big time and there's people want a new music. But when Poulenc's run out of steam, as it were, or run out of self-esteem, he sort of has to find some way of reinventing himself. And that happens in the 30s, and he, he's looking for stuff. He finds Eluard. Eluard's about beautiful things, about the timeless, about the eternal. Whereas time is against you if you're, if you're a wonder boy. Also, Poulenc, as a kid, was so pretty. Did you notice these photographs? My God, he's such a pretty young composer. Mm. It, it didn't quite stay with him for life. He was, uh, um, but this reinvention idea is brilliant because basically that's what he did when Bernard left him. He invented himself as a southern living, mainly in the Hotel Majestic and Cannes, and later in um, in the in the Bagnol um, en Forêt, which is that little town um, near Cannes. Um, visiting Italy all the time. He reinvented himself as an opera composer. Yes. And that's the time of the Carmelite. Recording time, yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah. he, he, yes actually, his, his, his publisser became recording, which is a quintessential Italian yeah. publisher. He abandoned all the Salabers and people like that and went straight on. I mean, that's another story, his, his life in publishing. And I do cover a bit of that here in the book. It's quite an interesting story about his, his career with different publishers. But I think that element of... Denise Duval came on the scene, and although she was not a great melody singer, she was a great and glamour. She had she was a star. Mm -hmm. She had that star thing, and he wrote Carmelites with her in mind, and Mamel de Teresias, and uh, also La Dame de Monte Carlo. But in a sort of a sense, the glory period, in terms of the songs at least, is undoubtedly the thirties and forties, isn't yes. it? I mean, and into the fifties, up to the end of Le Travail du Peintre. Yes. That's where one feels that he's doing things in song. He said, je suis la pri primauté. He said, I am the world's best song composer. And he, 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 he didn't say it to everybody, but I think he said it to Simon Girard, who he could be honest with. I think and, uh, yeah, the reinventing thing is interesting. I think he's perpetually reinventing himself. From the word go, from, from a teenager, I think he's making versions of himself all the time, which is why there is an accepted version, like a, like a Hitchcock um, um, silhouette, as a Poulenc silhouette, as yeah. it were, or a Jacques Tati silhouette. Yeah, yeah. He, he's, he, there's a person called Poulenc who invents himself all the time. But these songs you talked about, first of all the Elua songs, and then the later Polynaire songs, and all around there, Max Jacob, I think, is basically in the Polynaire. And the Lorca songs, for example, which I love, they're Eluar songs, aren't they, really? That poetry could easily be by Eluar. There's the, so I think those two strains of honesty, honesty about your sexual, sensual self on the one hand, and your 
Catholic. He was a Catholic. He believed in God and he believed in confession and forgiveness and all those things, um, which we would nowadays call spirituality because it's such a wishy-washy yeah, term. Yes, I think it's. I think there was also. I think that's what the music tells us. I think there's also an awful lot of shame and complication. Yes. Um, I think. I suppose because I grew up in the 1970s, post Stonewall, when everything was going well, it seemed incredibly impossible to imagine, um, even back to the 1950s, when it was a dangerous thing to be gay. And of course, in France, it was never dangerous in the same way in terms of blackmail, because it wasn't against the law. Nothing is blackmailable in France. Is <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. in a sense, when you come from a family of such grand dignity, the haute bourgeoisie, and when you have people really disapproved of homosexuality, like you know, Sati was not was very anti-gay, and and a lot of other people, uh, and you've got little pools of people like Cocteau or Diaghilev or people who were sympathetic, but particularly in Poulain's young years, both in his home background, etc., in his religious background, his father was very religious. It was not okay to be gay, and I think. That element of it being a light-hearted thing, deep down inside himself, I think there was a great amount of guilt about that. Absolutely. And the flamboyant choice, the the um, the Cocteau Diaghilev, uh, yeah. Noel Coward, Binky Beaumont flamboyant yeah. course, yeah. was not open to him because it wasn't his style at all. I mean, we see him occasionally at dragging up for the old party, but that is not a choice for him. He's not built for it. No. He's built like a docker. He's not built for... <laughs> I think one of the things that he found most formidable about Albra, however, is that actually in being in that type of company where there were no innuendo jokes, I mean, yes. in gay company, he rather liked um, gossip and outre. I mean, he was capable of uh, letting his hair down, shall we say. And of course, they didn't do that at Albra. Yeah. And he significantly withdrew from perhaps the biggest challenge of being for quite a number of days. He went for two days, I think. That was his single visit. Um, uh, and uh, didn't like it very much. So, is there a way in which, a part of Poulenc's life, in which he's happy or open to be a gay man? Well, I think deep down... Um, is there a milieu where that works for him? I'm not absolutely certain of that, ever. Because shame is something that goes very deep very early. Yes. And I think it does depend on how you brought up, and it does depend on the commune for. And I love the Poulenc and Solange family. They're adorable people, but they are very, 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 not exactly high society, but they're very upright people. I mean, when you see his family background, this is not the family background which immediately, you know, I mean, there was Uncle Papou, mm -hmm. uh, Marcel Royer, who was his mother's brother, who was... Very, very discreet. He was a boulevardier. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there were various ladies that he effortfully courted and he never quite married. There was that narrative, you know, about... A, con a confirmed bachelor. A confirmed bachelor. <laughs> yes, there's that element. Uncle Papou never came out, but I mean looking at Uncle Papou now with his taste for music hall and his taste for things like that and the idea of him being a, a, a confirmed bachelor and a lover of women doesn't actually seem very convincing. It's interesting to me because here's a, as you say, a gay man who has no milieu is quite the opposite from, from Piers and Britain. Piers and Britain can make a castle of which they are, as it were, I was going to say king and queen, but they are, they've made their world and they're in it and, yeah. and they can relax. I mean, obviously they, they can't relax, but you know what I mean? But for Poulenc, there's nowhere really to be. And I think that's why he's below stairs, above stairs, with the posh salon, with the Princesse de Polignac, and with the um, the cab drivers. Um, well, a cab driver. Well, a cab driver. <coughs> I mean, the thing about Poulenc is that he was very devoted to Raymond Détouche, um, who lived in Oise for years and eventually married a second time. He had a child, and Céline, the second wife, was very much a part of the Poulenc household. But Raymond Détouche, um, who actually was a, a minicab driver, we would call him today, who had various clients being ferried back and forth. And remember, 
Poulenc never drove a car in his life. Yeah. He, he needed to be either driven or these endless train journeys. He must have been in more trains on his ups and downs because he was a manic, manic, manic traveller and worker and performer. That's another thing we could discuss. But when it actually came to it, Raymond de Touche was sort of hidden. He wasn't exactly like Mrs. Rochester in the attic, but there was an element of him never actually coming and on one occasion, because he knew Pierre Fournier and because he knew the cello sonata, Poulenc writes to Marie Blanche and says, as a very, very special favour, and this will happen only once, would you very kindly allow Raymond to come to the salon to hear the cello sonata? I mean, he'll be very quiet, he won't disturb anyone. And then you suddenly glimpse not only the closet, but the class structure yes. of, of, of la vieille France. And I, I don't like Poulenc for that. I think we should judge people by how they treat their lovers, don't you? Yes. And, um, and to a certain extent, that's where it falls down with yes. him. Um, but I think it's because he's got nowhere to be. Yeah. He's got nowhere to be. And no wonder he's travelling in, in hotel rooms. The hotel, of course, is the great place for someone who has nowhere to be. He's got a house in France, that he wants to be in in Boise, he wants to be in Paris. He's got a house in Paris, he wants to be in the country. He wants to be touring endlessly because touring is... We're going to, you know, it's your life. We're going from A to B and we're in hotel rooms. And so it means you can't be anywhere because you can't. It's actually very similar to um, an, a, a composer who, in the last part of his years, for 20 years, never had a home other than Hotel Saint-Saëns. And he was similarly emotionally unsettled and unanchored. And, a, and a, 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 a gay man who couldn't be a gay man. Yeah. Except Unless you go to Al Algeria. Yes. <laughs> In a sort of a sense, that that element of being restlessly everywhere. I mean, shutting up his own home and going week after week, whether it is to Noise, whether it is to uh, Cabastique with the Polignac, or to Hier or down in the south of France with Marie Laudenoy, or indeed to Brive with Matt Boredon or wherever. It's that element of rootlessness. And I was told by somebody that uh, this I'd never had any actual evidence of that when he gave birth when, when he had a daughter and he had a very brief fling with an old friend called Christmas, Freddy. Christmas fling. Yes. Yes. And, 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 yes. yes. and Marie-Ange, wonderful Marie-Ange was born, um, that he used to go and spend time playing houses in a sense as if he was the father figure. His fantasy was to be, as part of his fantasy was to have a wife and a child and a household and to be the type of upright person that his daddy would have wanted him to be. There's that sort of element of unresolved conflict. It's like the Vinterizer poet looking through at uh, someone else's bourgeois existence. The Toysha, yes. The Toysha, which yeah. will never be his. Yeah. It's interesting, and that's the feeling I get. Dort wurde nicht nicht bis dort das Glück, he can't be anywhere because he doesn't make sense. But what I find in these songs, particularly the ones of the 30s and 40s, that actually there's somewhere he can he can be and live and exist. And it's interesting that the, the thing you're talking about, about jumping from idea to idea, of course, in some of the music, that's kind of hopeless because he just runs out of ideas and has another idea. And so we, the Sinfonietta, the piano concerto we talked about, and even the two piano concerto and the organ concerto, they're fantasies. They're just literally fantasies. They are stuck together. But in a poem, you can often do that, and the way he, for example, Montparnasse, famously, a great, great, great song, he did one line, two lines, in a certain key, and made, boasted about the fact I waited three years and I got the next line, and they got yes. this line put together. But of course, that's a great way for him to compose anyway, isn't it? Because it's making a virtue of his patchwork skills to make this beautiful, astonishing thing of... And it's because it's, it doesn't sound like Sinfonietta, but loses its way halfway through, because it's held together by a great poem. And if you've got a great poem, your patchwork music will always seem complete, won't it? And I think that is perhaps the best example, or the best explanation, of why Poulenc was a superb composer, because he had, as it were, the pattern of the poem to bring the thing together. And as you say, that there is an element of him as a stained glass window, very appropriate for someone who, was, who a part of him was so deeply Catholic and everything, that the stained glass window is an entire picture when you step back, but when you actually look closer, it's fragments. 
what I think of a lot is, is the editing of a movie. Cut, 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 put a soundtrack on it and music, and it looks like a complete made thing. And in fact, it's made up of 20 takes, probably a week apart. You see what I mean? So, and, and that, I think, is how those two by the Feu de Soir, the Eloir songs, the um, Dans le Jardin d'Anna, mm -hmm. Montparnasse, the Apollinaire song, those great songs, the big, rangy masterpieces are made up of, of, of a single urge, but but fragmented, but it's, it is, it is the, the poem that holds it together, and that's wonderful.